Dave, you're live. Hey everybody, it's Dave with DII. Thanks for tuning in with us. Uh, we've got Samuel Whiting with us today. It's going to be a great interview. We're going to be talking about breathwork and handpan. Uh, and it's going to hopefully talk about how you can uh, learn how to relax, reduce anxiety when you're playing, uh, especially during performances and that sort of thing. Uh, how you can, with breathwork, uh, learn a little bit faster, a little bit more, uh, and so get your brain going, that sort of thing. So we've got all sorts of fun topics. Uh, don't forget, if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, uh, press the red subscribe button below the screen and become a subscriber. It'd be great to have you as a subscriber. Uh, don't forget also, if you want to become a, one of our uh, newsletter subscribers on our website, go to davesislandinstruments.com. Go all the way to the bottom of the home page and you can click on the newsletter option and give us the, enter the email and that sort of thing in your name. And you will get notified of all sorts of events such as this that are uh, going on here at DII and also special deals and that sort of thing. So I'm the handpan, main handpan builder here at DII. I've been doing this uh, tuning uh, handpans and steel drums for basically 30 years now. So I've been doing it a long, to long time. Uh, but in, you know, with all that experience, uh, there's still new things to learn. And that's why I wanted to bring Sam on. Sam's a really an amazing guy. He's got his own Instagram channel. It's at Whiting Energy. Uh, and you can check it out. Maybe while we're talking, you can check out his channel and listen at the same time. Uh, anyway, for right now, let's bring him on screen and we'll start the discussion. Hey, everybody. Hey, Sam. How's hey, Dave. It's great yeah, to be here with clapping. you. Nice. <laughs> this interactive live experience with DII on YouTube Live for coming in. That's live. right. Yeah, man, this is great. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and excited to explore and to share with everybody and uncover really what's possible in life. That's been my pursuit and my continued question as I integrate and infuse practices and the latest science that what and where can we find purpose and meaning in our life? And that started at a very young age for me as yeah. an elite alpine ski racer. I grew up in Massachusetts and New England and really fell in love with the mountains and bomb in the mountain in the cold winter, uh, playing in the woods. I was fortunate to grow up in kind of remote nature. Yeah. So this element of play has always been with me throughout my life. And so in, in, in short, I went on to retire from alpine ski racing after attending a elite winter sports academy in Vermont and decided to pursue business school, going to university. I refound my love for music. As a kid, I grew up playing piano and had put that on the side as sports kind of took over the forefront of my time. And at that, while I was in college, uh, house music and, and DJing became something I was fascinated in. So I would be nice. home with my CDJ mixer and I was really into the the craft of beat matching and finding textures and tones and how melodies can infuse to create something unique, this journey yeah. of music, if you will. Yeah. So that became like a deep focus of mine going through college, graduating university, and within that full pursuit and going out to do gigs, starting a boutique record label with my best friend. I experienced the first loss in my life, which was when my mom, dad, my grandfather passed away. And mm -hmm. in coming together as a family, an aunt suggested we all go do something together. And I walked mm -hmm. through the doors of a hot power yoga studio for the first time and had this unique experience from being an elite athlete with intense training and that discipline to then loving to play in the woods and this freedom in my life. And then the music all coming together in this packed room that was sweaty and hot, challenging. Yeah. Also the grief and emotions yeah. I was going through that in that room, I felt myself go beyond this thinking mind. I often struggled in school growing up with reading and math, and I would feel like I was stupid or I wasn't good enough. And mm -hmm. by the way that this class was running a vinyasa yoga practice with the breath and the movement, I felt myself get out of thinking for the first time in a very profound way. And yeah. that captivated me to start practicing yoga in a, in a full on daily practice. So that was really the beginning stage of the work that I'm doing now, yeah. which was started all with breathing and, and how we can start to connect the dots within ourselves and understand 
the experiences that we've had throughout our life and how they bring us to the way we're perceiving ourselves in the world right here and now. So yeah. I like to call myself a human potential specialist in that my nice. focus is on breathing exercises, cold exposure, like an ice bath, or exposing yourself to the elements and getting out in nature, and then nervous system education, how we can understand these biological principles that are inherent within our, our physical body and through action-based practices like breathing, movement, so much lifestyle intervention is encompassed within this perspective, but how we can trigger mechanisms within our nervous system to help steer our state of being and yeah. to create shifts of perspective and open up this access into pulling from the well of potential that lives within all of us. Absolutely, so, absolutely, yeah. Well, that, I love it, man, that's a great story. You've got all sorts of fun stuff in your history. And uh, um, what I wanted to know also actually is, uh, so well, hold on, let me, let me tell you my quick story about you. So the way I met Sam was he came into the shop here at, uh, in Lakewood, in the DII shop, and with his friend Reese. And Reese had already, uh, had already owned a hand pan, he was gonna get it tuned. Uh, and actually, uh, oh, okay, and then I met uh, Sam, he was with him that day. And that's when we had our first interaction and Sam ended up buying a hand pan, which was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, but it also, that's where, there it is. But it also turns out that his now girlfriend, before they were uh, together, she had come in several years before and actually bought a hand pan from us. So uh, I, that's my favorite story about you right now. You guys have like the hand pan family. <laughs> all coming yeah. together. It's yeah, all exactly. the game. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that's my story with you with hand pan. But what's your story with hand pan? How did you first see it or where did you first hear it that sort of thing well as I moved through getting involved in teaching yoga professionally I started to explore other modalities and I came across this man named Wim Hof who is mm -hmm. known as the Iceman he's from the Netherlands okay. and something I was feeling and reflecting on in my life was that I wanted to start bringing yoga out of the classroom there were so many people I was excited to want to share the practices with that I was starting to experience and, and pull from within myself, this growth, this adaptation, the sense of confidence and courage that was developing through consistent practice. And yeah, you hear yoga and to the general public, some people are have an aversion to that. So yeah. when I came across Wim's work. It really spoke to me and his love for nature and this power of the mind and how we can do simple practices like getting in an ice bath or doing this very simple breathing technique to start strengthening this connection between brain and body and how that shapes the experience of the mind. So I went full in to the Wim Hof Method Academy and became a certified instructor. And as I immersed myself more into the, the focused breathing, the field of breathing, I was looking for music on Spotify and a lot of the, the like relaxing music had this, this sound and I was like, what is that? And all of a sudden some people within the Wim Hof community started bringing their hand pans around and I was introduced uh, yeah. to it through the Wim Hof community and sure. found it to be this very potent instrument that just was so beautiful to play during breathing sessions. Absolutely, so I yeah. always was interested to get one and wanted to have a hand pan to infuse into my guided breathing practices or even just to play because they're so beautiful. And yeah. so the day that I went in with my friend Reese as he was getting his tuned and primed up by you, you got to visit the uh, the master and the expert. I, I couldn't <laughs> pass up taking one home in your beautiful store. <laughs> it was hard to even pick one because you have so many amazing pieces. And Thanks, I'm man. just so delighted with what I was able to bring home the sunset D minor, yeah. I believe it is. And it's just yeah, been such yeah. an awesome tool that, to be honest, I have not integrated into live guided breathing practices while yeah. I play and ride, but is something that I very much am excited to challenge myself in bringing to the work that I love to share. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Um, that's really cool. So Wim Hof, that's his name, right? His first name is Wim, last name is Hoff, right? Correct. Then, yeah, so Wim what, Hof is a man what, from the Netherlands. From the Netherlands, yeah. So what does it mean to be certified in the Wim Hof technique? Well, Wim Hof 
as I mentioned, he's from the Netherlands. He has a beautiful and captivating story through his life, really as a seeker and looking to connect to this feeling that he always was in pursuit of, the feeling of being alive, the feeling of potential within, the feeling of connection to nature, ourselves, humanity, something that we sometimes maybe can't comprehend because there's these these subtleties of nature that we still don't understand even in the field of science. And so as a seeker, Wim went out into nature, into cold water, started challenging himself with incredible feats like hiking up to Everest in shorts to the death <laughs> zone, 6,000 feet without any wow. oxygen. Wow. Uh, running a half marathon barefoot up in Lapland, which is in the Arctic oh, Circle. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and just wearing shorts, it was three degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah. he continued to baffle science with these incredible feats and also then bringing himself into be ultimately a guinea pig as he developed these breathing techniques, had this inherent intuition that through breathing, we can in fact regulate the autonomic nervous system, which is something biology books have said, oh, it's autonomic. Our hearts beat, digestion occurs, our pupils dilate. The yeah. functions of biology that are inherent in part of our natural intelligence. And as he stated, you can regulate it and subsequently the immune system. Oh, so okay. just by chance, Routabout University, which is in the Netherlands, was doing a study uh, exploring the immune response. And they were injecting thousands of people with an endotoxin, in simple terms, a dead bacteria. And yeah. across the board, Everybody has flu-like symptoms, a fever, chills, nausea. Yeah. Wim went in and performed his breathing techniques prior to injection of the endotoxin. And then following this interval of time after injection had no symptoms, maybe a light minor headache. Yeah, yeah. And this, was, this went on to be replicated by a cohort group, a controlled study, and, wow. and was the turning point in showing that the techniques he had innovated and formulated within what is now called the Wim Hof method is in fact a, a very powerful access into self-regulation, uh, nervous system regulation, and how we can trigger mechanism within our nervous system and biology for adaptation, growth, and shifting from certain cause, um, health, negative health causations that autoimmune diseases, chronic stress. It's so prevalent in the world right now, heart conditions, yeah. cardiovascular issues. Yeah. So he has been a pioneer in this work for, for his whole life ultimately. And through all of the challenges he did, Guinness World Record of being in an ice, a chest of ice for over two hours. And he gained recognition by, by doing these techniques. And, and then ultimately people wanted to learn about it. So yeah. the yeah. Wim Hof Method was born and they created an academy. Okay. And that's what I felt called to explore. And I dove full into the training program, which is about a year long from yeah. online practice, personal practice to then spending time with Wim and the team going through training, learning about physiology, the breathing technique, practice teaching, and ultimately embodying the practice through your own personal practice to then right. take it out into the world and share it. And yeah. so I lead workshops, retreats online programs and and it's continued to evolve from there as i've come across and made found amazing mentors who are leaders in the field of neurobiology andrew huberman dr jack feldman and so my website i have i share all kinds of different offerings and on the program wow programs tab oh there's the um, website uh -oh. which oh, there you go yeah, so for people who are interested, please feel free to head over to samuelwhiting.com. And on the programs tab here is my latest schedule, which is my new live stream offering. So I have a few different tiers uh, offering a Monday morning live stream practice. Oh, it looks like the schedule's not popping up. It should be popping. But anyway, um, yeah, Monday morning live stream sessions. Uh, an evening session on Monday night and on Tuesday also a live stream. So the aim is to start our week live, connected in community and allowing this to be a way to build consistency within your practice. I also offer a, a monthly mentorship call 
to answer questions, explore best practices, and, and really uncover some of the latest science and theory. So if, if people are interested to get involved in that, I, I welcome them to explore or drop me a DM on Instagram at Whiting Energy. Um, yeah. the website has some light information about everything here. But um, yeah, it's been an amazing journey of learning and development. And ultimately, my my mission is to make this successful to the world and to empower others and how they can integrate these tools and practices to create their own unique design that is for their lifestyle. And everyone Absolutely. has the that's, goals that's the coolest. Yeah. So uh, before I forget, um, anybody that's watching right now, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comments uh, section uh, of YouTube. And Daniel's in the background. Hey, Daniel, say hi real quick. Hello, this is God. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Daniel's in the background. <laughs> making actually, all the there, uh, screens change. There's actually a, a, a couple comments. I'm just going to add okay. this. Tanya, one of our I great customers, know. saying Aloha. Aloha. Uh, we have broadcast music, and I love this quote right here. Music is the answer. So awesome. Yes. And then uh, actually more broadcast. I'd love to show the comments. Hoff, the Ho Wim Hof is the ice man is awesome. Yes. Yeah. The ice is nice. Yep. Shout out to Wim. Yeah. 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 So and if Wim anybody has, has a any great further questions app, or I oh, guess. what was that one? Uh, Wim has a great breathing app from broadcast music. So. Oh, OK. Yeah. That is a great reference. Thanks for popping that comment up. You can go to your, the app store and type in Wim Hof method. And there oh. is a very simple guided uh, interactive framework for you to experience the Wim Hof breathing technique. Um, again, within the world of breathing practice and nervous system self-regulation, there's so many different protocols for breathing. That's some of what my innovation of the practice has been, but I, well, the Wim Hof method always works. It's a deep practice yeah. that we can bring into our day. It's a great way to start the day or wow. to relieve stress or tensions that we then pick up as we move through our day to practice in the evening or any time yeah. that we need a reset. So I highly recommend wow. integrating that into your life or checking it out for those who are, are just learning about it for the first time. And they're, yeah. she's, uh, they're also checking on the live sessions that are showing up on the website. I guess it was... Just oh, not okay. Showing up on my side. Okay, so, maybe a glitch on. Yeah, a glitch. glitch here. So, uh, so let me bring the Wim Hof meets music uh, part of the session here. <laughs> so let me tell you my story. Sometimes with breathing uh, and playing music. So, um, as a drummer, right, uh, you wouldn't think that breathing would be a problem because it's not like you have an instrument on your mouth and it's not like you're breathing air in and out that sort of thing. So even when I was young, you know, playing the drums, uh, it wasn't really an issue that I was aware of, with the exception of when you get anxious, right? Like say you've got performance anxiety or something like that, or you're really nervous before a performance, then obviously that comes into play. Um, there was one point when I was playing trumpet in college, I was learning how to play trumpet, and uh, that was a completely different experience for me than playing drums, because when I got on stage to play with this uh, college, like, jazz band it was just like the bottom <laughs> bottom of the barrel jazz band that they had at the, at the college but i was going for it right um but man i'm telling you it was a completely different experience figuring out how to deal with my anxiety and my shortness of breath while playing a wind instrument right because here you are trying to put air through this instrument uh but you're also nervous and you're aware of that so trying to get that deep breath was a real challenge um and so I, that was something I, I never really completely understood how to resolve. And even these days, sometimes if I do get uh, anxiety of any sort uh, prior to a performance, usually I get anxiety when I have to express myself, interestingly. Uh, that's usually when I get mostly uh, most an anxious is uh, like even if I had a hand pan and there was a crowded room and somebody on the microphone before I started playing said, oh, this guy is all of these great things and you're going to love every single thing, right? Next thing you know, the anxiety goes up because you've got all these expectations that you've got to fulfill, right? So uh, when that happens to me, I usually get really anxious and my, my breath gets shorter, you know, and I feel like I can't take a complete breath. And I have a feeling that this isn't just me. I have a feeling that a lot of people that are might, might be listening right now or a lot of people that are in the music industry or playing handpan, 
might have a similar kind of reaction when they get into a, a like a performance situation like that. So, uh, what kind of technique or what do you what would you suggest uh, as like maybe a pre-performance kind of way of relaxing uh, mm -hmm. so you can reduce your anxiety? What do you think? Thanks for sharing that. I think this is a fantastic thing to explore. We're all human. We're all the same in that we have a nervous system in that we're all totally unique in that our experiences shape the meaning and the way that we engage with the world through what's happened in our past. And that can manifest in unique ways of anxiety, aversion to engaging in certain ways. And, and it's all part of the process. It's, it's part of being human. Uh, I like to say sometimes anxiety is just excitement. A misunderstanding. Yeah, right. And yeah. that, that's inherent within especially being a performer or going on stage that you want to show up in this way to share your heart or to share your music and to share your craft. And, and there is a, a level of a standard you want to hold to that. So there's always nerves that can come up and, and firstly want to recognize that that's natural. And, yeah. and it's okay if people are experiencing that. I feel it through my life as well. And mm -hmm. what's very unique here in this question is that we take anywhere from about 600 million to 1 billion breaths in our entire life. Everyone will fluctuate okay. capacity. Yeah. Most of those breaths are unconscious. So when we're sleeping, when we're engaging in tasks through our day, when we're Breathing, we don't have to think about it. It's, again, part of this autonomic nervous system. Yeah. So as we move through our day and take on certain experiences or engage with certain patterns of respiration, especially mouth breathing, when we mouth breathe or this becomes a habit of ours, we start, the breath ends up becoming more shallow mm. and we start to breathe more in our chest. Now, the mechanism involved there is signaling more of a sympathetic nervous system tone. So it can make us feel more anxious inherently. And also what ends up happening through mouth breathing is that we overventilate and we drop the levels of CO2 within our body, which can create vasoconstriction within the cardiovascular system. So that creates vasoconstriction in our forebrain, which is where we want to have thinking, planning, action. It can make us feel like frustrated and confused, like we can't perform. And so that's just painting some of a picture to highlight this fact that breath is a behavior. Think when you get surprised or somebody jumps out of a corner, what happens and what, how does the breath respond? Mm -hmm. <gasps> or when you get home and you sit down on the couch after a long day. And... <sighs> so just looking at those two different breath behaviors, Again, in the autonomic nervous system, there's two branches, sympathetic nervous system, not involved in sympathy, but think energy, alertness, focus, fight or flight. Yeah. So the healthy nervous system responses to all of that. And then we can also have habituated patterns just from experiences we've had where we trigger and engage into a certain response when maybe there isn't an actual threat there. Okay, I'm back. Dave's back. Dave's not back yet. Uh, here Did we lose Dave? Okay. I'm here. We're here. <laughs> and we're still live, everybody. Yeah. Um, Sunspots. Quickly then. Sunspots. <laughs> Parasympathetic nervous system. Calm. So if we look at those two breath behaviors that we explored, look what happens. The inhale, that shock or startle response, <gasps> it's an inhale. So that can be okay. very driving to the sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. On the other end, when we got home and we went, ah, that's a long, gentle, extended exhale. Yeah. So inhales can be more sympathetically engaging. Exhales connotate to soothing the nervous system and moving into a more calm state. Oh, okay. And inherently, that's where we can start to build this, what I like to call understanding of your nature through yeah. breathing practice through nervous system education, we can have this understanding of our nature. So then there's this compassion to, oh, okay, I'm feeling anxiety. That's okay, it's part of my nature. There's nothing wrong here. But then we build our awareness 
about what's actually happening. Ooh, I'm holding my breath or I'm mouth breathing. My breath rate is very fast and that's signaling me to actually move into a state of being that is why I'm feeling anxiety. Mm -hmm. I like to say there's a state of being for a state of breathing and your state of breathing influences your state of being. So yeah, we talk okay. so about, you're basically saying like the first step is to recognize where you're at with your anxiety, right? Just kind of like figure out like, okay, I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm anxious and I'm recognizing that that's okay. <laughs> right. Uh, but then the secondary thing would be to what, like figure out which, which breathing method or how to breathe to overcome that or what, what's the next step or it's a great question i like to say meet yourself where you are so as your yeah. awareness hones in on what state you're in and if you're feeling anxious observing the breath pattern and the nervous system responds very well it, it wants action we shift through behavior so if okay. you deploy a breath behavior that can meet the anxiousness maybe that's a few faster mouth breaths for example yeah. <sighs> You start to work your way down, then shift in nose. Okay. Mouth. So you're starting to then lengthen the exhale and signaling to the parasympathetic nervous system to then innervate. And we shift from this more sympathetic hyper arousal state to then calming. Interesting. Okay. As we talked about as well, when you're playing the instrument, it can be very easy to be like so hyper focused that we go into apnea or holding yeah. our breath. Right, and right. That's, that's actually cool. that right there. That's what I see a lot of with uh, customers that come in. Sometimes we'll have like free hand pan classes and say you have four, four or five people around you. Usually there's at least one person that when you show them like how to play, like for the first time, like you're saying, you know, like do this or whatever. Or usually sometimes when they're just learning how to strike the note, right? Just get the sound out of it. Frequently, there's at least one person that's holding their breath. And so that's why we have this little sign right here that says, just breathe. <laughs> because usually I'll stop and I'll say, hey, don't forget uh, to breathe while you're learning, uh, right? Because like what you said is, what did you call it? You said it was something, yeah, apnea, right? Yeah, that means Where just stop breath. breathing. Yeah, so go ahead and like, sorry to interrupt, but go ahead with that thought then. No, well, what, what comes to mind here is, as we talked about, 600 million to a billion breaths, autonomic nervous system, breathing is reflexive. So it just happens. We don't have to think about it, but we can take on certain habits and dysfunctional breathing patterns. And okay. when we're engaged in learning environments like playing the hand pan or we're performing on stage, inherently a nervous system state can then trigger and bring in a pattern of breathing that maybe isn't serving us, feeding into anxiety or yeah, okay. keeping us in this kind of rigidity because when the breath think of the breath like the stream of life we want it to be fluid and adaptable yeah. it's so intelligent to to meet all of the challenges that are constantly coming at us all the information on the inner and outer world of, of body and nature so yeah. that's really where breathing practice can be so impactful because we're taking this focused time, whether it's five minutes, half an hour, an hour, it doesn't have to be so long, but we're bringing volitional engagement into our breathing pattern and thus our nervous system. And we can start to disrupt certain patterns of breathing that maybe aren't serving us. Uh, and makes sense, yeah. So especially if we wanna set ourselves in motion for a great practice session on the handpan or we're about to go on stage and perform yeah. taking five minutes before you go on stage to even take smooth breaths in and out through your nose that are cyclical so it could be in five out five okay. or maybe you do box breathing and it's in four hold at the top for four exhale four hold at the bottom for four okay yeah. again as you continue and start to practice breathing you find what patterns feel good for your nervous system and inherently it's just like going to the gym you're strengthening a muscle you're strengthening the neural network from brain to body that's connected to the breathing musculature the respiratory system and that builds capacity and then ingrains it to be a reflexive behavior so we don't fall into patterns of either holding our breath or breathing shallow in our chest, which would signal us to feel anxiety or not be focused because we have not 
we don't have efficient blood flow to our brains. And again, painting quite a broad brushstroke here because everyone's unique. Also yeah. some questions here, but it's very natural and normal to, to experience that when it comes to performance. So if we can set ourselves up before we go out on stage, it's kind of like starting the engine before we, we take off. It needs to be warm yeah. and ready. Yeah. So a quick question about the box technique, because I've actually been aware of that for a little, uh, some time. Uh, <laughs> but it must be my, my brain, my anxious brain or whatever. Uh, and sometimes I get stuck, like somebody told me I need to count like four and, and four down and four over. But let's say that I'm still feeling anxious. I'm like, well, I got to do four. <laughs> so <laughs> like, is it as simple as just changing the number? Like if it's not working at four, change it to three. Like or, or like three counts basically or three seconds or whatever, right? So like say you breathe in for three seconds, one, two, three, and then you hold for three, right? And then you uh, exhale for three, and then you hold for three, right? And then you do it again, right? Inhale, hold, exhale, hold, right? Does it have to be a certain amount of uh, time on each one of those little box sides or is that negotiable? It's all negotiable, Dave. It's all negotiable. It's a great question. Okay. Yeah. If, if, if you start with four seconds and that feels like it's challenging, you can always cut the number down and yeah, yeah, yeah. You try four rounds of that. And that's only even a, about a minute or so of breathing practice. Yeah. So you could, you could start with three count. And if that feels easy, increase the count to four. Or maybe even round by round, you can increase the count until, and just notice what comes up. Inherently, you're practicing, so you're strengthening this neural network again, and strengthening right. your breathing musculature, building awareness, and really, that's what practice is all about: building awareness. Yeah. And and that's where we can start to pick up on certain patterns, like oh, I I notice I when I don't pay attention, I end up starting to mouth breathe. And that can be a wow. great signaler of maybe why somebody could feel anxious or feel like they're not, they're low on energy, for example. There, there's so much to explore here. And I wouldn't say there's a right or wrong way to practice, but yeah. carving out even a few minutes to just observe your breathing and then start to bring in more conscious volitional regulation of it has a very potent result over time. Yeah. And as I like to say as well, consistency compounds. You know, you don't go to the gym one time and end up having a credible boost in power and endurance or playing the hand pen once and being able to play like Dave. So it's a lifelong process of growth, learning and development. And really it takes a discipline to create that environment for you to to practice. Yeah. Hey, hey, oh, it looks like Daniel might have like a comment. Daniel, is there any comments out there? Or? Um, there is a, actually a couple comments. Okay. I, uh, broadcast, thank you for all your comments. Um, uh, broadcast music it says we can only, we can survive only on a breath. That is all we need. Go breathitarians. Awesome. Yeah, breatharians. Well, <laughs> breatharians, great point. Yeah. we can go how many days without food, water, and only a few minutes without breath. I mean, there are some. Point some outliers yeah. there who have done breath holds for 20 minutes, but breath is the stream of life. And there are people out there who are in fact called breatharians who haven't eaten food in a number of years. There's some nuance to that practice. But, wow. Wow. Um, wow. Well, then broadcast so, music, another one, oh. Ray Mayor is a great example. I don't know who that is, but we can check him out. Tanya says me, I'm going to add that. Tanya says me. <laughs> I need to do breathing. Yeah, you probably heard awesome. the same, something that she related to. Yeah, she related to. And so then, with, with the well, hand one, more, what do you one more. One more. Oh, okay, okay. And then MW, so nice to see things being a topic associated with the hand tan. So I just wanted to share that. So, yeah, thank you. So, Sam, what do you think about this? I'm just totally throwing this out there uh, just as an idea. So let's say I'm on stage and I'm feeling anxious. Um, with the handpan, it's actually a really good uh, instrument to do this with because you can strike a note and you can hear the sound and then the sound drifts away and becomes silent, right? So I would say, I mean, you, it, you could almost make this into a performance piece where you could strike the note and then take a deep breath. And then when it's silence, you know, then you can exhale and then hit the next one, 
I don't know, what do you think? Like some, some kind of thing like that where it's just a really slow, deliberate thing and you can take a breath in. And then maybe in the next one you strike, maybe you breathe out. I don't know, what do you think? What do you, that sounds, I like the idea. <laughs> well, that's beautiful and powerful. It, it, it ends up making it a meditation. Yeah, and yeah. You can get more creative with that. Maybe it's a few notes on the inhale and then it's with the exhale, it's going down from the pitch. And yeah, yeah. Another technique I'd love to share with everybody, it's called the physiological sigh. Inherently, as humans, we've developed this mechanism where about every five minutes or so, we take an extra large breath. And this is just a natural biological phenomena in that we have all these little sacs inside of our lungs called alveoli, mm -hmm. and they're a mucous membrane. So what can happen is that they can collapse and stick together. And since the mucous membrane creates surface tension, we need to take an extra full breath to pop those little sacs of air open. Mm. And this can be a great way to release stress and tension with just one breath, or you can do three, four of them at a time. And ultimately it's a full smooth breath in through your nose, a little extra sip, and then you pop and burst the exhale. Watch it settle and land. And then begin again to your natural breathing rhythm or do a few more breaths like that. Hmm. But as you were just, so that could be something that you even get creative with. All of this is yeah. such creative expression. And I don't right. want anyone to feel like there is a pigeonholed way to do this right. Yeah. But look, as Dave, you're going with this creative feeling of, wow, how can I create rhythm in my body just like breath is a rhythm and have that become part of the expression and the craft and the art yeah yeah i know it's an interesting idea because instead of saying okay i'm going to perform now <laughs> and then usually what happens is when you start performing you, you like start to inhibit your breath right or you start getting short of breath or whatever maybe that might be a typical thing but like if you incorporate the breath with the music i, I it's a kind of a neat idea i never really considered it before before we started talking breathe in I mean sometimes it kind of natural because you sometimes see performers doing this on stage you'll see it like a close-up of them and they'll play something and you can see that they're breathing like taking a deep breath or something like that but conscious of your breath while you're playing I think that might be just one of the real critical things of kind of like what I'm talking about with anxiety is like while you're playing rather than trying to make it like a, a separate issue you're playing versus your breathing you bring them together I don't know I'm just making this stuff up <laughs> but yeah well, you're know, from what we're talking about yeah because yeah. As, again as we've acknowledged it it happens that we'll end up holding our breath while we play yeah. and something that something physiologically that happens within that is that we build carbon dioxide up inside of our body and that mm -hmm. signals the brain carbon dioxide is the signaler for us to take a breath it's ultimately one of our baseline stress molecules so if we're in this apnea and all of a sudden co2 builds the brain gets this signal take a breath and it starts to trigger a little, it can manifest in anxiety a little bit of stress and then all of a sudden we're like <gasps> whoa so if we can start to create a reflexive smooth breathing pattern just by focusing on creating that rhythm and breathing with it mm -hmm. that then all of a sudden we're we're disrupting our baseline pattern right right yeah so people so can let's... really get playful with that yeah Out, two, three. 
like a, like uh, I'm supposed I'm assuming you could even do that uh, if you were a therapist or something like that. You could maybe just play the handpan and, and just tell them like every every four hits, <laughs> take a deep breath, you know. And as I go down, then release. It might be interesting to try that with uh, like a group session or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and especially right. in getting breathing practices like that. Yeah. Do you mind if we switch now from from the anxiety issue to the learning issue? So again, when I was saying sometimes I will have a group of people and you can totally tell at least one person is holding their breath while they're trying to learn something. And then what you just mentioned was with the carbon dioxide going to your brain, it creates a, what was it? It creates a um, stress signal. Impulse yeah, stress signal. So uh, um, it would behoove you to breathe more while you're trying to learn something. Is that what I'm get, gathering? Yes, and actually, especially the Wim Hof method practice, which okay. you can do three to five rounds of breathing, which you could start that before your learn your before your practice. Okay. What happens when we do the Wim Hof technique is that you go into a state of hypoxia, which means low oxygen. It's a very acute interval of time, but there's research being done at the University of Florida by an incredible neurobiologist by the name of Gordon Mitchell. And they're studying hypoxia with uh, spinal cord injury patients. And they're, they've found that by doing intermittent bouts of hypoxia, which is what we can trigger with the Wim Hof breathing technique, that you increase your somatic motor control, so more coordination, in addition to your respiratory motor control, so more efficient breathing. You also release other things as related to endurance, like EPO, so you produce more red blood cells, but you also release BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is associated to improved learning and cognition. So you're ultimately setting yourself up for a better learning experience. And then as through breathing practice, your breathing is more efficient and fluid. You're not over breathing, as we've discussed before, where you have lower levels of CO2 and thus less blood flow to the brain. Wow. So in terms of learning and something also that I just love about the handpan, Dave, is yeah. that we have all of our responsibilities, whether you're a student, a professional, a parent and, and you're focused on tasks. We have this conditioning now of like productivity, having to just be on all day. We're sitting at a nine to five at our computer. We're taking in so much stimulus and yeah. feeling the pressure to get things done that in feeling that pressure, we don't take a break. Right. And what the neuroscience continues to show is that we can be more effective, more present, more creative, when we do intervals of focused attention, like 90 minutes of task orientation. And then what I'll do is go sit out in the shade, not the sun, because my hand pan will cook. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll just play my hand pan for five or 10 minutes. And it's this way to deliberately disengage from the tasks, from the thinking, from the learning. And it actually allows us to ingrain what we're taking in so it becomes reflexive. And then we yeah. go back to the task and there's we can be able to write or do the computations, whatever it may be on a personal yeah. basis with way more drive and focus. So I like to consider being deliberately engaged with something and then deliberate disengagement. You could yeah. do the same with your with, with hand pan practice. You're practicing, yeah. you're really going for it, and then just let it go and take a walk, come back yeah. and play. Yeah. But I've found the handpan to be such a beautiful instrument that is one of my outlets when I'm like reading scientific papers, teaching, doing programs, etc. And then I get to go and take this time to just let my mind fly free. And I find it to often surprise me that I've been jamming for a little while and I'm like, whoa, that was like half an hour. And we yeah, go yeah. it can go by brain. fast. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that's really cool. That's real, and that's kind of an interesting uh, that you mentioned. Like, if you do a breathing technique before you actually uh, start practicing, it can increase learning capacity. So um, that also makes me think. Like, if we had a class in here, it'd be kind of interesting. Just do like a quick breathing session before you start the class, right? Or yeah. before you start teaching. So everyone's seated, or everyone's whatever they wherever they are with their handpan ready to play. 
it could be really anything, any, any kind of instrument, any kind of teaching experience. Um, but then you could just say, okay, let's just like sit for a minute. Let's do some inhalation, hold it, release it, you know, kind of do that like a cyclical thing, kind of like what you're trying to get at, I think, right? Some kind of breathing technique just to relax you and get the, the oxygen inside of you, get your brain all prepped with uh, what it needs. And that would be interesting to try that to see also like if people had less apnea during the class at that point, Let's, it would be interesting to see if that was reduced, like if people um, were more able to breathe you know, throughout the class. That'd be fascinating to try that out. Yeah, sounds like an emerging study, maybe a little subjective. We'd have to come up with some objective markers to check in on. But there, yeah. like you're speaking to, and in, in, if it's an in-person class, whether it's a private session or a one-on-one -on -one hand pen lesson, there's something about breathing in a group that brings everyone together in such a beautiful way. And we get out of thinking, we prime our nervous system as mammals, humans, we what we seek connection it's just yeah. a fundamental principle of our mammalian nervous system we want social engagement we're social beings yeah. we also yeah. have that other side of being able to survive so we're looking for threats so if, if we want to be learning we can't be in a nervous system state that's like is there a threat around so using breath to help make us bring us into a what we could call ventral vagal state. This is associated with vagus nerve, which is a parasympathetic network within the nervous system. That's responsible for feeling grounded, feeling present, joyous, creative. So using breathing practice to help activate that pathway can yield potent results in terms of, in this example, having a great handpan lesson or an amazing jam yeah. session. Yeah. Or hey, speaking, of people, hey, speaking of people getting together and breathing, uh, I just have to mention this because I thought it was super cool. But you posted this on Instagram the other day that you were working with the 49ers football team doing a breathing uh, breathwork session. Yeah, uh, this just this earlier this week, I was blessed to go up with my friend Mike Posner, who is also a, an amazing Grammy nominated artist, singer songwriter. He I walked across North America, summited Mount Everest, and along the way in his experience as an artist, wanted to you know, pursue what the purpose and meaning in his life was after the loss of his father and just a rise to fame. And with, along that journey came across Wim Hof, and he started practicing Wim Hof breathing, getting in the cold. And so we connected, our paths crossed through these practices, and uh, we were both just up there sharing the breathing technique with the entire uh, San Francisco 49ers team, which was amazing because as I've talked about and referenced a few benefits to breathing practice on what could be a sports performance perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So this other end of connection, and it was amazing to see how the team came together in such a powerful way as they get ready for the season. So watch out wow. everybody see how they are how they kick into this season and and i'm really excited for them that's right no that was just so cool to see that post man i'm glad you put that on up there that all right fun. this is, we had a couple questions really quick okay. um cold plunge judd duncan awesome Hi, judd. hey judd um how cold is the temperature of samuel's cold plunges Ooh, yeah where do you where do you go with that hey judd thanks for tuning in and for asking there is a lot of nuance and perspective to explore there. Emerging science, as we look at what's the minimum effective dose, there was a paper that was just published about four or five months ago um, in Denmark, Susanna Sodberg, it's winter swimmers, and really the optimal dose that they're talking about is 11 minutes a week. So that could be spread out within, I like to say a general form of a practice for a cold water immersion is about two to three minutes. Some people do more, but or you could even just do a dunk or turn your shower cold. But 40 degrees to 32 degree water is, is sort of the window. Cold water is considered anything from like 67 degrees and below, but cold enough to the point that it feels cold to you and you wanna get out, but you can then be able to stay in without it being not safe. Cool. Yeah, That's... I was, I was going to ask, so, because um, obviously cold water can also give you hyper, hypothermia, right? 
So, um, what, what's a um, well, like, a, what's a best practice? Do you you like hang out with a friend uh, for the first couple times you try it to make sure you don't like overdo it, or like, what what are some uh, best practices for that? Yeah, this is an important topic. Uh, we've talked about breathing practices, specifically Wim Hof method breathing. Acknowledge that there are a lot of other fantastic breathing techniques out there. Ultimately, you build your own intuitive toolkit as you start to engage with practice. But safety is very important. All of the breathing techniques are not to be done while you're driving a car, um, while you're near water. These are not free diving techniques. So you'll notice maybe you, wow, I can hold my breath for so long. This is something not to be done in or underwater. So that's very important. If you have any cardiovascular issues or concerns, always speak to your medical provider. That's not to protect us, but also for you. And in relation to cold exposure practice, the theme is to start gradually. The body is intelligent, it adapts. So through short little doses of what is acute stress, the cold, are, we start to build capacity. And so you don't have to go jump into a, a thousand pounds of ice in a, in a tub you can turn your shower cold and just start to gradually immerse yourself into the cold. Uh, being with a buddy, if you're doing it in nature is great. Make sure that you're not going somewhere that there's glass and you could cut your foot or if yeah. you're breaking ice to be careful, that also can be sharp and cut you. Yeah. Um, if you have questions, please reach out to me. That's what's great and why I love sharing this work is that we create a focused container to be able to learn the best practices and experience them in a safe way whether that's yeah. a practice session or a, a, a day workshop, even a weekend or week long retreat, I host all, all of the above. Um, and then, yeah, to just find what feels good for you within the cadence and to take your time in, in building your practice. Yeah, you know, I must admit, because I've seen pictures of you um, in like an ice tub or something like that with like a, a group of people and I'm like, oh, it seems like I wouldn't want to do it, but I kind of want to do it. <laughs> So one of these days, one of these days, I totally want to get together with you and give it a try. It seems like a really interesting experience. Yeah, it's such a great practice. That was a picture from actually in uh, Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire. I was hiking. It was like negative 10 below out and I was hiking in shorts and no shirt. There's so much potential within the human body. And really, it's not the sky that's the limit, but the mind we get, we can, we can hold ourselves back with thinking, overanalyzing and having this idea of what's possible for ourselves, but most often, maybe 99% of the time, the, our excuses are, our, our reasons to not do something are just excuses wearing fancy clothes. And yeah, that's really what the is all about. Uh, one more question, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, broadcast music, and this one always comes up broadcast, but we'll probably do a quick answer on this, but what percentage yeah. of your customers want their hand pan tuned to 432? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we hear that question so cool. frequently. That's great. Yeah. So, uh, Sam, this is probably not quite, has, doesn't have anything to do with breathing, but it, the question has to do with how, how the hand pans are tuned. And uh, cool. so I'll just, we'll just answer it real quick. So most hand pans and most musical instruments in the Western culture are tuned to, quote, unquote, A440, meaning 440 hertz. Uh, like this A, I think it's this one here. Uh, it basically, the, the little sine wave uh, goes back and forth or up and down like 440 times per second. I believe that's what it is. Um, and so some people uh, like this way it sounds if it's you know, rather than 440 times per second, it's 432 times of uh, vibrations per second. And so uh, there, some people have theories on how it affects the body. Um, uh, other people kind of just kind of like, you know, roll their eyes at the idea. Um, my personal experience with tuning 432 instruments is that um, I'm not uh, presently intuitively aware of any difference, but like uh, there's like an underneath subconscious uh, way that my body reacts to it, uh, where if I play a 432 instrument, I, I just feel like I, I, I just kind of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I sink a little bit, or I like I relax a little bit somehow. And there's I can't tell what it is exactly my reaction to that change. Um, whether it's like a very technical thing because I'm used to tuning instruments to 440, 
So it might be simply that my brain is telling me, hey, something's different. It's not quite the same. So I'm not sure if it's my brain just technically thinking about it and realizing that it's different or that, or that it's actually affecting my body in a different way. I'm not, not entirely sure how that all works. Um, like I said, other people have different experiences um, and they have um, different ways of thinking about it, but that's my personal experience. Um, and the, the, only, the only technical thing I have to caution people against 432 is that uh, it really can only play with other 432 instruments at that point. If you get into a collection of instruments that the, all the others are tuned to 440, but yours is 432, yours is going to sound like it's quote unquote out of tune. It's going to sound flat. So it's, it's a great idea if you want to play solo or on your own. Uh, but if you're playing with a collection of people, it's probably not the best idea because it's not going to blend really well. Right. I think uh, um, the percentage wise, it would be around 10% around that area like people would get custom pans and they would do oh maybe not even that uh, not, I, 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 would, I would put less, it yeah. less than that less yeah. than that so I, I was just yeah. being conservative so yeah yeah cool thank cool. you so uh one one more question sam on uh, yeah one more question sam on uh on the breathing and i think you mentioned it along the way so we talked about reducing anxiety we talked about increasing learning um, and then it, you mentioned it just very briefly you said something about the muscles and how breathing can affect the muscles so to me, uh, all of those things, breathing would enhance your performance on a handpan or on any instrument because it, it touches on all of those things. And all of those things are you know, important for working and playing a handpan. So just tell me a little bit, a little bit more on like, how breathing affects the muscles, your interpretation. Well, breathing mechanics is a big focus of the work I share. We as we talked about mouth breathing and how chronic mouth breathing can lead to poor breathing mechanics where we're keeping the breath more shallow in our chest. You hear a lot of things like belly breathing. We can easy, easily just push our bellies out. So it doesn't really mean anything. And diaphragmatic breathing, unless you have paralysis of your phrenic nerve on the left or the right side, there's two phrenic nerves that run and connect to the left and the right hemidiaphragms, which make up the diaphragm. This is our primary breathing muscle. Everybody is diaphragmatically breathing unless you have paralysis and that the diaphragm is paralyzed. So that's just a, 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 a misconception that I like to pop the bubble of. But through breathing practice, we're strengthening our breathing musculature using tools like the Corgis Ball, which is really one of my favorite breathing mechanics tools. Shout out to one of my dear friends, Jill Miller. Uh, Tune Up Fitness is her company that makes these. And there are ways to you know, manipulate breathing musculature to loosen up fascia so then the breath can be more fluid. I, I even put this behind my back and, and it gives me super lumbar support and I feel more upright mm -hmm. so we're not letting gravity take us. Yeah. And so, yeah, when our breathing muscles are efficient and can move fluidly and powerfully and dynamically, the rest of the nervous system responds to that. And that's a layer of practice that I've found to be very impactful for people in their daily life, whether it's sports or moving through what they do in their unique lifestyle. So building awareness around how breath moves in your body, how different frequencies and patterns of breathing can influence your state of being and ultimately then the impact that has on the biochemistry to improve oxygen util utilization to leverage carbon dioxide as a way to create vasodilation to improve oxygen delivery to shift our relationship to stress as it is the signaler to take a breath and if we're sensitive yeah. to it it can be very um, arousing to our bodies meaning we get anxious, we feel stressed, uh, we go into panic attacks. That's really actually the paradox of a panic attack. <gasps> yeah, yeah. In feeling the panic attack, we're starting to over breathe because we feel like we can't breathe. So we're breathing more to try and grasp the breath. And with yeah. this higher frequency of breathing, we're lowering and lowering the CO2 more and more. And we're not allowing the oxygen to release from the blood. If you put this fancy little pulse oximeter on, it would probably read 98 or 100% oxygen saturation, but CO2 levels are so low that it's not getting off of the hemoglobin. So that's where the fancy bag trick comes in because oh, you yeah, start yeah. 
for the breath and you're breathing in and getting more co2 back to the system oh and then i was wondering what that was for <laughs> oh okay i'm okay I don't yeah, have yeah. that's the paradox often when we feel like we can't breathe we breathe more and in the act of breathing more we're actually inhibiting the ability to get have cellular respiration fascinating that's interesting uh, that's really interesting i never really thought about that because i've seen people do that thing with the bag but i'm like <laughs> i don't know i didn't know what the purpose of it was i didn't understand that's interesting okay yeah well man this is awesome super illuminating thank you so much for your time today uh really great subjects and great subject matter and i think you really uh had a wide uh, amount of information for us to help us with our hand pan playing and then, you know that's the whole point of our, our classes here um but we haven't really played the hand pan yet. So do you want to play the hand pan as we, uh, as we cue out of this? Yeah, let's jam it down, Dave. Yeah, um, man. okay. As we talked about within our, our offline conversations, I just play for fun. Absolutely. So that's the invitation to everyone else who's maybe just starting to play, is get out of your own way. Yeah. And, Enjoy the process of play and the creative energy that comes when we can just enjoy listening to the melodies of life. That's right. Man, you're rocking. Such a pleasure to be here with you, Dave. <laughs> I'm going to take a nice deep breath in and say thank you. Let it go. Enjoy. And don't forget Thanks for to... Thanks everybody. Don't forget. Dave, thanks so much for having me and for Absolutely. creating this amazing instrument that I love so much. I look forward Just to setting breathe. up again in the future. If people have questions, please feel free to reach out to Dave and I. We'd love to hear from you. And maybe we can plan a live stream that we have a guided breathing practice with the hand pan live in the mix. That would be rocking. Sounds awesome. good to me. All right, guys, awesome. enjoy. Take care. Right, Daniel everybody. in the background. Thank you, Daniel. Later. Thank you, Daniel. Later.